In this seminar, we're going to be looking at cohabitation law. Um, we'll be thinking about the range of claims that might be available to clients who separate from their partners to whom they were not married and were not in a civil partnership with. And we'll be comparing the approach of the court in England and the court in Scotland considering the pros and cons in each jurisdiction. Now, as we know, this is an area of law that's so often misunderstood by the public at large, which often makes for tricky conversations for advisors. Uh, without further ado, uh, we're very lucky to be joined today by two brilliant speakers. Robert Gilmore is a partner at SKO based in Edinburgh. Robert is a leading lawyer north of the border. He's ranked in Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners with an acknowledged expertise in cohabitant claims, having acted for the successful applicant in the groundbreaking and widely reported Supreme Court case of Gow against Grant. Thank you for joining us today, Robert. Good morning. Sue Brooks is a skilled family lawyer and mediator at Mills and Reeve. She has a wealth of experience advising unmarried clients in resolving their finances upon separation. Thank you, Sue. Good morning. Now, before we begin our discussion, uh, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded. And if you have provided your contact details, uh, a recording will be sent out to you following the session. Uh, we are also inviting questions this morning. So if you have a question, please do type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your toolbar, and we will endeavor to address it towards the end. And if we don't have time, uh, we will respond to you afterwards, so long as you haven't selected for your details to remain anonymous. Now, there's so many reasons why people are cohabiting, but not married and not in a civil partnership, which would offer them additional legal protection. Given the range of different cohabiting couples, and certainly in England, the fact that the law is often ill-suited to dealing with these sorts of cases, what we know is that the outcome for each is so dependent upon the specific facts. And so in, in mind of that, um, rather than run through the law in the abstract, we thought that the most helpful way to think through the possible outcomes would be to consider a couple of case studies. So we come to our first case study. Let us imagine we have Angus, who is 64, and Jesse, who is 61. Uh, they, so Angus is divorced, Jesse is widowed, both have grown up children. They meet at a bridge club and they hit it off. Angus lives in a four bedroom house in the suburbs that he has owned uh, for some time. He owned it with his wife for 20 years and now solely for the last five. Jesse owns a one bedroom flat and after dating for a year, Angus asks Jesse to move in with him. She agrees and after discussion and with Angus's encouragement, Jesse sells her flat and uh, stops working. The modest sale proceeds of her flat go towards the couple's general expenditure. So the redecoration of Angus's house, a new car, a luxury world cruise. Five years later, the relationship founders and Jesse moves out into rented accommodation. Jesse comes to us seeking our advice. Sue, could you give us an overview of the approach taken by the court in England and Wales? Do you think Jesse has a basis of claim in England and Wales? So in England and Wales, we don't have a statutory regime for unmarried couples. Because they're not married, Jesse cannot pursue financial remedy claims against Angus, which means she cannot seek maintenance for herself and she cannot seek any share of his assets. So she really is dependent on the complex law surrounding trusts and proprietary estoppel claims. If there's a dispute and the court is looking at this, it will divide the assets according to who owns what. There's two types of ownership, the legal ownership and the beneficial or equitable ownership. And equity follows the law. So the presumption is that because in this case, Angus is the sole legal owner of the property, he's also the sole beneficial owner and Jesse doesn't have an entitlement. For her to prove otherwise, she would need to show that Angus is holding the property on trust for the two of them. The easiest way for her to do that would be to produce an express declaration of trust by way of a written deed. But in these, in these facts, there's no such document. So because we're in a domestic 
context, we then move on to looking at whether there is a constructive trust. And for Jesse to prove there's a constructive trust, it is a two-stage test. Firstly, was there an express agreement, even if it's only verbal, or a joint intention, which can be inferred objectively, looking at the whole course of dealing? And secondly, did Jesse rely on that to her detriment? And on these facts, I think it's clear that she did rely, or she certainly acted to her detriment. She's given up work, she sold her house, she spent her money on Angus. But detriment alone is not enough to prove to the court there's a constructive trust. And the key question here is whether there is evidence that Angus intended Jesse would have an interest in that property. So we really need to sit down with Jessie and go through everything she remembers about exactly what was discussed and exactly how Angus encouraged her to see whether objectively there is evidence that he intended that she would have an interest. If she can prove that, we then move on to the quantification stage. and We need to look at exactly what we think Jessie's share in the property would be. And again, we need to start by looking at the evidence and whether there is anything to suggest the two of them agreed their respective shares. But in the absence of evidence at the quantification stage, the English court can use its discretion to determine the fair outcome. So just to be clear, we don't start by looking at the fair outcome in these cases. The court can't impose a constructive trust where there isn't one. It's only if there's clear evidence that she is a beneficial owner that the court can then use its discretion in terms of working out what her share may be in the absence of any clear evidence to the contrary. I think on these facts, Jessie's really going to struggle because although Angus has obviously encouraged her to sell her house, that doesn't mean that he intended to give her a share in his property. So she really would need clear evidence. And it may well be that he just stood back and let her spend her money and enjoy their life together. And that isn't enough for there to be a constructive trust. So if we assume she hasn't got a beneficial interest, the only alternative claim would be one under proprietary estoppel. And I think this would be easier for Jessie because she doesn't need to prove that Angus intended she would have an interest in the property. She simply really needs to prove that he led her to believe that she does. So there's three stages to a proprietary estoppel claim. The first is that Angus gave her a promise or made her assurances that are tantamount to a promise. And we're looking at what he said and whether the objective person would reasonably understand those to be promises in the circumstances. Secondly, that Jesse relied on whatever he said to her. And thirdly, that he acted to, the, sorry, that she acted to her detriment. And again, we can see the detriment in this case, and it really comes down to what Angus said and whether objectively it's enough to be tantamount to a promise. As with all property disputes in England and Wales, the cases are really fact specific and the onus is on Jesse to prove her case. If she is successful with a proprietary estoppel claim, it doesn't automatically follow that she has an interest in the property. Proprietary estoppel is an equitable remedy. So the whole purpose of the claim is for the court to put right the wrong that would have otherwise in, uh, be left if, if um, Angus had made the promises and he was allowed to get away with it. And Jesse was left without any interest or without any remedy. So the court must balance what Jesse understood and what her expectations are with the detriment that she'd suffered. And it must do the minimum to put right the wrong. So the court has various options. If it's absolutely clear that Jesse was promised an interest in the property, the court can grant rights of ownership. But it can also grant rights of occupation if it's clear that Jesse has been promised a home for life, but not a share of the beneficial interest. And it can also order lump sums. Proprietary estoppel claims are often brought where the sole legal owner has died, and in those cases it's easier for the court to order a grant of occupation. So, for example, in this case, if Jessie was promised a home for life and Angus had died, that might be what she got. But on these facts, Angus is still very much alive and is living in the property. So if she can establish she made the promises, and obviously she relied on it to her detriment, I think the best that she could hope for is a lump sum, effectively by way of compensation, and it may or may not be enough to enable her to buy any property. So under English law, she still could be left quite vulnerable and she may not be able to rehouse. Thank you, Sue. That was really clear and insightful. It's so rare, isn't it, that your client comes to your meeting uh, with a, pro a written promise or an email from their former partner with a really clear and established assurance that they've been given. It sounds like it's going to be a real uphill battle for Jesse. And the reality is people don't think about it. So that's that's the issue. 
we're trying to piece together what has happened over the years. Yeah. Whilst in England there's no codifying legislation, Robert, I understand there is specific statutory provision for cohabitants allowing for financial provision on the breakdown of a relationship in Scotland. How does it operate? How would Scots law apply if Jesse were seeking a remedy in Scotland? Well, I think we can say quite confidently that Jesse would have a claim here, and we can say that uh, because essentially she exists and she did succeed. Um, these facts are the facts from the, the leading case on cohabitation law, Gow against Grant, which was considered by the Supreme Court in 2012. As a case close to my own heart, because as you mentioned, I acted for Jesse in this case. Um, and in Scotland, we don't, as you say, we don't rely on old common law principles to deal with uh, the breakdown of modern relationships like this anymore. Since 2006, we have had specific statutory provision allowing for financial provision to be made where cohabitation breaks down. And the scheme we have has often been described as a compensatory scheme. It's certainly not akin to the financial provision that exists on divorce. But what it allows the court to do is to make a capital sum award, and it can only be a capital sum award, to an applicant if they can show either that they've suffered economic disadvantage in the interests of the other party or any children of the relationship, or if they can show that their partner has gained an economic advantage from contributions they have made. Now, the section is quite complex because it also requires the court to do an offsetting exercise. So the claim is for economic disadvantage. The court has to look at offsetting any advantage that might have been gained um, from the former partner, from the relationship. And if the claim is based on an economic advantage to the partner, then there is an offsetting exercise to be done by the court of any commensurate disadvantage that their partner may have suffered. Um, but in this case, Jessie's claim proceeded on the basis that she'd suffered an economic disadvantage. She sold her flat to throw her lot in with Angus, and at the end of the relationship, she was left essentially with, with nothing. And the important thing that Gow against Grant did, that the Supreme Court did, was to address really how the court should approach the statutory provisions that we have in Scotland. Should they be uh, interpreted broadly or narrowly? Uh, and the Supreme Court came down unanimously in favour of a broad interpretation. What they said was that any economic disadvantage didn't necessarily have to have advantaged the other party or even have been intended to. It was enough that, that Jesse had done something in the interest of generally furthering the relationship. And it was the effect of the transaction that mattered, not the intention of the transaction or what the parties had in, had in their mind specifically at the time. You'll see there that there's quite a difference opening up between the approach that would be taken under the English common law principles. Um, the court was clear that it's not the intention of the parties, and we don't need to look at what was or wasn't promised. It's the effect of what they did that should determine how the court approaches it. So promise or reliance or things of that nature don't really come into consideration there in the same way. And the court also said that the guiding factor for any award should be fairness rather than a detailed analysis or accounting for any contributions or transactions made during the relationship. It's a broad brush approach that the court has told us to take. Um, the way Lady Hale characterised the exercise in um, her opinion in Go Against Grant has often been picked up on in subsequent cases. And what she said is that really what the court is doing here is looking at where the parties were at the start of the relationship, looking at where they are at the end, and then looking to fairly uh, recognise any advantages or disadvantages that have accrued from the relationship. So what that means is that our statutory provisions open up a wide range of circumstances where a claim can arise, some of which undoubtedly would fall within the ambit of the English common law provisions, but others which almost certainly wouldn't potentially including Jesse here. So although we have perhaps a, a wider door for applicants to go through, um, when we move on to other issues such as remedies, we still maybe don't have um, quite as many tools in our armory because in terms of the statutory provisions, um, the only remedy available is a capital sum. We're, we're not in a situation where we can look at um, the court awarding interest in, in property or anything of that nature. Thank you, Robert. So comparing the two uh, the two jurisdictions, I think what you're saying is that 
under Scots law, it's likely that the threshold is lower in terms of eligibility, a wider door, as you say. It's easier to evidence that you have some claim in Scotland in that you're not looking for evidence of promises, but more the effect of the decisions taken during the relationship. Yes. And so as advisors, do you think it would be fair to say, therefore, that every claim in Scotland has a nuisance value? Um, I think that is sometimes said, and certainly because of the lower bar, as you describe it, I think anybody faced with a claim being made um, will often have to take a realistic view about the risks of uh, defending that and the fact that the bar is relatively low. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yes, I think generally when you're advising people, you, you probably would be advising them that the claim is likely to have uh, or it's certainly worth thinking about the nuisance value of the claim. It's not so easy in Scotland to, to bat a claim away completely. And in terms how in terms of how the Scottish court quantifies any award that's going to be made, it seems that that's fairly open from what you're saying, Robert, bearing in mind how the Supreme Court and the Appeal Court interpreted the wording of the statute so differently in, in Gow against Grat. And this wide discretion of the court and difficulty in Um, pinning down a clear formulation is really familiar to English lawyers too and and similarly controversial. Yes, I mean, compared with our approach to divorce, um, it is a much um, uh, less clear approach and and it has caused quite a lot of consternation among Scottish lawyers about how to approach advising on quantification in particular. Um, And if you look at the, the range of cases that have been over the years, there's quite a wide Um, range of different approaches taken to quantification of claims um, that have succeeded in the Scottish courts. Now, you might argue that that's that's the intention, that's what was intended, that the court was given a lot of discretion about how to approach this. And um, one might also say that having wide discretion is essential if the court's being expected to do fairness in, in a very broad sense. But in terms of being able to advise clients um, about where they stand and what their risk exposure is, that does present a fairly major challenge. Yeah, it's really tricky. Um, shall we perhaps move on to consider another set of facts? So a set of facts where there are minor children of the relationship. A typical set of facts that we often see uh, in reported cases, maybe uh, as per this slide. So an unmarried couple, Rose and Henry. Rose is very wealthy. Henry is the financially weaker partner who's the main carer for their two children, aged three and five. Now, let us assume that Henry's earning capacity is very limited. He had a very modest income when they met and he ceased working when Ava was born, again, with Rose's encouragement and agreement. <coughs> the Let's assume the children are privately educated. The family home is large and expensive and registered in Rose's sole name and the family have uh, lived a very comfortable life taking luxurious holidays and enjoy generally a very high standard of living. Would you like to start us off Sue by considering the application of English law to this factual matrix? So in this situation, again, because Rose and Henry aren't married, Henry's in exactly the same situation as Jesse was. He hasn't got financial remedy claims for himself against Rose. But because they've got children, he is able to claim financial provision for the children's benefit. So we normally start with child maintenance and parents can agree whatever the figure they want. But in practice, it's often agreed with reference to the statutory formula that is adopted by the Child Maintenance Service, because the Child Maintenance Service can assess and enforce the appropriate figure in the absence of cooperation. But in this case, there is a decent lifestyle and there is some money, so we also need to look at Schedule 1 of the Children Act 1989. And this gives the court the power to make wider financial provision for children. There's a range of orders that the court can make. So we start with top up maintenance. If the wealthier parent is earning more than £156,000 gross less pension contributions, which is the child maintenance service maximum assessment. And maintenance can be assessed with reference to a very high standard of living. There is case law which suggests that the court can look at providing the child with a good to lavish lifestyle. So it really can be the sky's the limit in terms of big money cases. 
The court can also order education costs and school fees, again, as part of a maintenance order. It can make one-off housing provision, whether by way of an outright transfer of property or more likely a settlement of property. So again, it's for the benefit of the children and houses can be put into settlement until the children reach the majority or finish education, which in practice can often be the end of tertiary education, including a gap year. The court can also order lump sums, whether one off or single, oh, a series of lump sums or lump sum by instalments. And there can be unlimited claims for lump sums over a child's minority. And lump sums can be provided for a whole range of reasons, including um, furnishing a property or buying a car every few years, or even in some cases paying the debts of the parent with care, if it can be shown that clearing those debts would be in the child's best interest. And in cases where there is a dispute, the court can also order legal services. So in this case, if Henry wouldn't otherwise be able to pay for lawyers to help him and advise him and to represent him in court proceedings, he can apply for a legal services order. So Rose would then have to pay his costs of taking her to court. He would need to give an undertaking that he will pay the costs back in the appropriate case, but it's still there in terms of, of the power that the court has. So the English court's power to order financial provision to help children is quite wide ranging, but it is important to note that it is only for the benefit of the child. So when the youngest reaches majority, Henry would be on his own and he can't expect to have enough money to save for a rainy day or to save for his pension because it is all about the children. Thank you, Sue. Robert, how does Scots law consider the burden of childcare and this idea of economic advantage and disadvantage for Rose and Henry? Okay, so there are some very important distinctions between um, our um, legal approach to this uh, and that that Sue's just outlined. Um, obviously, in Scotland, we do have a principle that children are required to aliment and maintain their children. <laughs> that, sorry, parents are obliged to do that. Um, and the UK-wide child maintenance service uh, rules apply. Um, and alimentary um, support includes payment of school fees. So in that respect, we are the same and the top up provisions would also apply for high earners. However, we have no equivalent of Schedule 1 in Scotland. Um, all we have is the cohabitation provisions that I've already outlined, which do say um, that where economic advantage or disadvantage can be established, the court can make an order specifically in respect of any economic burden of caring after the end of the cohabitation for any children. But the important point there um, is that it's essentially a bolt-on to a cohabitation claim, which is still predicated on the applicant being able to show economic disadvantage or advantage. The very existence of children in and of itself isn't probably going to be enough to do that. Um, so um, the scope for making a claim there is much more limited. And again, the remedies are much more limited. Even then, even if one could establish a claim on that basis, it would still be a claim for essentially a lump sum. It would not be um, getting into the realms of the things he was talking about in terms of provision of accommodation and so on. And um, those remedies simply are, are not available. And crucially as well, um, no order, uh, no legal services order, no provision to seek support for the costs of litigating to vindicate any claim one might have. And certainly in um, in my experience, um, from a practical point of view, the absence of that provision makes a huge difference. We, over the years, have advised many clients who have ended up pursuing remedies south of the border, specifically because litigation simply is beyond their economic reach in Scotland, but that provision opens the door to them doing something in England and Wales. So um, I don't think there's much doubt here that Henry is much better off uh, in England than he would be in Scotland. And does that mean then if um, if the relationship is akin to a one night stand, by which I mean there's no, there's a child of the relationship, but no cohabitation, then there's no possible claim in Scotland at all? Well, yes, Henry's in an even worse position because the cohabitation provisions don't apply at all if there has been no cohabitation. And presumably, Sue, whether it's a one night stand or a lengthy relationship doesn't make any difference in Schedule Absolutely. 1. Absolutely. So Schedule 1 claims can be brought when the child is as young as a day old and there's no standard of living or no expectation on the child's behalf. It really is about ensuring the child's needs are met as it grows older. 
and the expectation is that the child should live in an environment that at least bears some resemblance to the wealthier party. So the court doesn't want there to be a great disparity between the two parents because that's not deemed to be in the child's best interest. So under Schedule 1 claims, the court's looking at the overall resources, looking at the needs of the parties, um, looking at whether there's any health issues or, or disability in relation to the child. And it's also looking at the welfare of the child and the standard of living that the, the parents have to determine what the fair outcome is going to be. And it, it takes a very broad brush approach to that. So yeah, well, certainly within even within the cohabitation provisions and the ability of the court to make an award for the burden of childcare, there's nothing in our provisions that en enable the court to look at welfare issues at all. So in this situation, Henry is in a much stronger position were he to make a claim in England than in Scotland. But I can also see another set of circumstances in which Henry had a flourishing career, uh, which he put on hold, perhaps indefinitely, perhaps irretrievably to look after his and Rosa's children and his earning capacity may be reduced as a result and this would be irrelevant in England but the economic disadvantage would be a factor for the court to consider in Scotland if an application for an award was made there. Yes, I think were that the situation, um, Henry's in a very different position, absolutely. Although the... Um, the evidential difficulties that there are in establishing um, what might have happened and how a career might have progressed, um, I think, are well known to solicitors who've tried to do that in the past. It's not not an easy um, sell on an evidential basis for a court, but in principle, absolutely, that is the sort of thing that the Scottish cohabitation legislation is designed to address. And again, I think under English law, that's where people are left very vulnerable because when they've got young children and they've potentially been out of the employment market for a shorter period of time, they're not in as bad a situation as when the children have grown up. You know, they've lived together for 30 years. They've been the primary carer of the children for that long. They've not worked during that time. And in that situation under English law, they don't have a claim because they can't pursue a Schedule 1 claim because the children are no longer minors and unless they can establish a trust or an ownership of the property or there's clear proprietary estoppel they really are on their own. Absolutely I think if we move this if we assume Henry had some kind of career or prospects of a career and we move this on 20 years the balance tips and he's probably better off in Scotland. Um, I am just looking at a couple of questions that have come in um, so Beth is asking uh, where a child is over 18 and there are no issues of disability, but that child wishes to go to university. What is the process to get an unwilling parent to pay towards their university expenses? Who makes the application? Would it be the adult child making an application under Schedule 1? And only if there wasn't already a child maintenance order in place immediately before they reach the age of 16, instead of the parent. If the parents were once married, can the parent make an application under the Matrimonial Causes Act and seek an order for payment of university fees, even though that child is no longer a minor? Sue, did you want to um, did you want to uh, speak to that? So if there's no maintenance order in place already and the child is over 18, it would be the child that would be making the application. So, I mean, in reality, I, I've never seen that happen in practice because you don't see children taking their parents to court. But in, in theory, that is what should happen. And I'm sure in some cases it will do in practice. Um, I'm not sure, does that answer the full question? I, I missed... Um, uh, in so terms of... So again, even if the parents have been married, the, the court doesn't look at the adult children's needs as a priority. There is, of course, the ability for the court to order maintenance and, and to look at who's paying what in terms of education fees. And I think the, the parent would be in a better situation under the Matrimonial Causes Act in, in the case of, of marriage, but it's still... It's the child's claim once the, the child has reached the age of 18 because they're deemed to be an adult in that situation. And it only is special circumstances, which I think as the question referred to as health or disability in practice, that impacts on the child's needs that would allow the claim to be pursued. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. That, um, that's understood. What are the risks of litigating uh, these, these facts in each jurisdiction? So 
under the civil procedure rules in England, the loser pays the winner's cost. And that's a real anxiety for advisors uh, in England, certainly um, as family lawyers, we're all a little bit afraid of this CPR, but also the, that's a really big risk and a, and a burden that needs to be taken into consideration when making strategic decisions about how to run any application. Is that the same in Scotland? Um, not quite. So uh, the the expenses, the issue of expenses is always a risk in litigation, obviously. Um, but because of the specific statutory provisions we have, um, claims of this type falls very squarely within the, the rules and procedure and the case law that relates to family law specifically. And the approach taken to expenses in family law, as, as I think it is south of the border, is a slightly more nuanced uh, and less black and white approach to expenses as, as um, in litigation generally. So the court will be a bit more hesitant to make awards of expenses and will tend to only do so in circumstances where um, the conduct of one of the parties of the litigation itself justifies an award of expenses being made against them, or in the other fairly common scenario where somebody has failed to beat an offer, and the court might look at making an award of expenses for um, the costs incurred from the date that any um, good offer was refused. But there isn't the same expenses follow success approach. And the court will often refuse to make an award of expenses in a situation which commonly occurs where um, the making of an award of ex expenses would so distort the principal award that the court has made is to defeat the whole point of the action. You know, courts will regularly decline to make awards of expenses in those circumstances. So expenses is always a risk, but probably less of a risk um, in Scotland in these sorts of cases than it might be in England and Wales. One thing I think is worth um, just mentioning at this stage that is a big risk in Scotland that always has to be thought about is the time limit for making claims. So it's an essential part of any claim under the uh, Scottish Cohabitation provisions that an application is made to the court within 12 months of the end of the cohabitation. Now, that's a very short timescale, and it's not uncommon at all uh, to be consulted by clients who are already out with the 12-month timescale and have missed, missed the bus for making a claim. It's also not uncommon at all to have a dispute over when the cohabitation broke down. Um, it's not as simple as simply the date on which somebody turned the key in the door for the last day and moved somewhere else. It's all manner of things can affect the question of when a cohabitation broke down. And the, there's been something of a mini industry of litigation around this whole question of the breakdown of cohabitation and whether cases are out of time or not. And certainly one of the things that one would always be doing in a first meeting with a client is drilling down beyond what they may say is when they consider their relationship to have ended um, mm -hmm. into the facts and circumstances just to form a, a view about where the risk lies. Is there a risk here that anybody on the receiving end of this claim may, as a first response, say, oh, well, we separated six months before you say we did? Um, so that is a, a big limiting factor actually on these claims in Scotland and a, a big risk that always needs to be considered um, with all the usual time bar um, uh, caveats for, for solicitors about making sure one has diaried properly and considered the issue and so on. So um, in many ways, that's a bigger risk factor than the expenses issue. Absolutely. If I had a penny for every conversation I've had with clients, married or unmarried, about the date of separation. Um, that's really interesting. Thank you, Robert. If I can just move on to think about jurisdiction, how important is it, do you think, for practitioners in England to have an understanding of the law in Scotland and vice versa, do you think? What would a client have to show in order to have a potential claim under Scots law? Well, the requirement in terms of the cohabitation provisions is that the court consider, can consider a claim where it would have jurisdiction to hear a divorce action if the parties were married. Now, the important thing there in terms of the discussion we're having at the moment is that jurisdiction for divorce can be founded on the domicile of either party. Now, what that means, of course, is that it's possible to have a claim where neither party is actually living in Scotland at the time the claim is made. It's even possible to have a claim where the, the parties have never lived together in Scotland. In fact, uh, I had uh, 
a fairly uh, big claim rumbling on for most of last year where neither of the parties were in the UK, uh, nor had they ever lived together in the UK. But because my client was domiciled in Scotland, oh. um, his ex-partner was able to make a claim uh, against him in Scotland. So the range of people who may be able to access the Scottish courts to make a claim when cohabitation breaks down is much wider than simply people living in Scotland. So from that point of view, I think it is important. One can easily imagine a situation where an advisor in, in England and Wales may be consulted by somebody who is living and working in England, but retains a Scottish domicile. So there are opportunities there for those clients and risks, of course, for them that they may be on the receiving end of a claim in Scotland. So um, that is, a, I think, a very important point uh, to bear in mind in that set of circumstances where the Scottish claim is potentially better. We've looked at the two case studies. Depending on the circumstances, the Scottish courts may be more favourable. It's always worth exploring. Is there a domicile issue here that we need to think about? And we, I mean, again, from an English perspective, that's absolutely crucial. And Robert and I have spoken about clients that have come in to see me who present as English. And it's only because I've asked about their domicile to make sure that I've, I've got all of the background facts that actually because of their domicile of origin, they do potentially have a claim in Scotland. So I'm straight on the phone to Robert to say, well, what do we think in terms of this one? And as an English lawyer, you need to make sure that you are giving your client the full range of options. And for someone who has been together, as I said, for 30 years and has no claim under the English jurisdiction, if you can help them to get a claim under Scotland, even tactically in terms of negotiations here, then it's got to be a good thing to do. Yeah, and I suppose from our perspective, um, where you have schedule one claims potentially available what what's your jurisdictional approach to those so again it's both habitual well it's either habitual residence or domicile so you, it, it's the opposite of what we've just said you could have two people or one party who is domiciled in england and therefore schedule one is suddenly opened up even if they are presenting to you in scotland so and i think did you say that you'd had a case of that nature yes i mean like, over the years choice. we've had we've had a few cases of that nature where We've ultimately advised clients to seek advice south of the border, and they have they have raised Schedule One claims south of the border. Yeah. So this is really important to have that understanding of of the other jurisdiction to be able to do your job properly. Absolutely, the takeaway is that you need to understand where you could have a situation where Scots law may apply to your client in England or vice versa. We need to be alive to the fact that there might be a potential claim in the other jurisdiction to, to ensure that those clients. Uh, have the proper advice and they can weigh up their their options. Thank you for that. Can we turn to the arguments for cohabitation reform in each jurisdiction? Now, I know that the Scottish law, the 2006 Act, is currently under review and we're actually expecting a report from the Law Commission any day, any minute now. Um, what are the areas of debate, do you think, Robert? What What is the direction of travel in terms of how Scots law is evolving in relation to provision for cohabitants? Well, um, the Scottish Law Commission website still says that they're going to produce a draft bill on this by the end of the summer. Now, we're now into October, so I think we're, we're stretching the definition of summer a little bit now because we still haven't seen it. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully it's imminent. Um, I think what, what we are fairly clear on is that the direction of travel here is to strengthening rights rather than diluting them. Um, there are a number of areas where the Scottish provisions have been criticised. Um, it's a few examples. The time limit of 12 months has been criticised a lot for being too short, um, excluding a lot of very good and valid claims. Um, one of the other major areas of criticism is that the range of remedies is too small, that a, a lump sum payment simply isn't a wide enough range of remedies that property transfer orders, orders of that nature really would be, um, are, are necessary to do justice in these situations. Because often, uh, certainly when one's advising, uh, what one finds is that the thing that um, your client really wants is their house. It's, it's their house that they want as much as it is um, you know, a, a, a lump sum of money. Um, that's often a, a second best option for them. Um, so whether we're going to move towards, and certainly the Law Commission have consulted on whether we should move effectively to a shadow divorce system, which people can opt out of if they want, or whether we're going to move to just um, 
building on and bolting on some more remedies and onto the more limited provision we have at the moment remains to be seen. Um, and of course, it remains to be seen whether the Scottish Parliament will choose to take up any of the proposals that are made. But uh, certainly for those of you south of the border who are interested in, in these things and how the law might develop for you, um, you might find it uh, useful and interesting to look on the Scottish Law Commission website at their discussion papers, because you'll see there a, a lot of uh, feedback and experience from Scottish lawyers about how they have found trying to grapple with new cohabitation legislation and the common issues and problems that we have encountered with that. The property transfer thing does seem very, very odd as an English lawyer uh, uh, and rather unfair that a court would not be able to order a property transfer. So often, as you say, your client comes to you, uh, the primary focus is the property that's been their home. Uh, so fingers crossed that there is some reform there. Um, are you able to shed some light on why the laws developed in that way, Robert? So why the elements that have been selected from the re the regime for married couples have been cherry picked in that way? Well, I think if one goes back to two thousand and six, introducing financial provision for cohabitants um, in and of itself was controversial. It wasn't by no means un uh, unanimously welcomed. And we had the same arguments that I think you have had over the years in England and Wales around whether or not it was fair to make provision at all and whether, in fact, many people were choosing and should be able to choose to keep themselves out with these sorts of provisions. Um, so I think to a large extent, the limited nature of the provision brought in was an attempt to find a middle ground um, and not to introduce anything that was going to be so uh, earth shattering um, that it would meet with opposition. And one might say that approach has worked because we are now, I think, quite clearly looking at a situation a couple of decades on, 15 years on, where I don't think there's much doubt that we are going to expand. Uh, and that kind of gradualist approach, I suppose, for, for those who do favour uh, financial provision for uh, on the breakdown of cohabitation, that kind of gradualist approach probably is working, has worked, one might say. Yeah, we also see the same resistance in England and Wales, don't we, Sue? Um, you know, practitioners have been campaigning for years for reform uh, of the law relating to cohabitants, I think maybe for over 25 years, but the proposals for creation of a new legislative framework just haven't got off the ground. No, we had the Law Commission um, carry out their consultation back in 2006 and they produced their recommendations in 2007 and then since then we've had private members bills going through the House of Lords and it just stalls and I think the issue is that there is, as you say, still a reluctance for people to accept that cohabitation is anything close to marriage, both from a religious and also potentially a, a social status and there's such a wide range of cohabiting relationships that whilst practitioners and academics are pretty much unanimous in terms of calling for change, actually what we're looking for in practice isn't unanimously agreed. So, you know, we could potentially go down the route of a de facto relationship like they have in Australia or New Zealand, where you've got the equivalent of the financial remedy claims that you would have on divorce. Or you could have something much more limited, as you have in Scotland at the moment, whereby you're looking at effectively compensating for the loss with the ability to make property transfer orders and um, order lump sums. Um, so it, yeah, at this stage, whilst we are, everyone is, or certainly all of the practitioners are still campaigning, there's no clear, clear outcome anytime soon. In August, we had the Women and Equalities Committee produce their report. And again, it reflected that unanimously all of the practitioners who are seeing the vulnerable cases are calling for the law to be changed. They suggested that we go back to the Law Commission and that the Law Commission reviews and um, updates their recommendations. We're waiting for the government's response at this stage. So we have to see what happens. But I think the reality is the government have their focus on other things at the moment. So I'm not sure that we're expecting any change anytime soon, but it is very much watch this space still in England. And I can entirely see why it is such a difficult question. Um, yes, the government have other things on their mind, but without any uh, 
clarity as to what the solution might be, uh, it's just so tricky to pin something down. And I would suggest that the view on how cohabitation should be treated compared to how married couples are treated by the law must depend to a great degree on the pool of cohabitees. And in fact, that is really wide. And maybe that's the crux of the issue. It's, it's for some cohabitees practicing what we might in family law terms uh, talk about as financial hygiene. Um, that's something they practice without much thought. They each very much would like to remain independent financially and would not wish it to be any other way. For others, it's a prelude to marriage. Um, for some, especially young couples, living together is simply a way to pool their resources and save costs. So it's a really difficult question when the pool of cohabitees is so wide. Should we have a, it's almost a, a political and philosophical question, how paternalistic should the law be on this point? Do we want equal sharing as a starting point for cohabitants or do we want a safety net um, so the eligibility requirements and there's an, or there's an opt-out facility? I think it's clear that we need something though because um, something like what 3.6 million families are cohabiting, that's one in four families at the moment. And there is a huge misunderstanding amongst the wider public about what they, they understand to be this common law marriage and they believe that they've got rights that they just don't have. And the reality is that people are left vulnerable because they don't understand their financial position. So the law needs to reflect the reality of society and to protect the vulnerable. And all of the recommendations that I have seen are trying to do that with the ability for people to opt out. So people who want to remain financially independent and people who have the ability to understand their position and to take steps to do something else could sign a document saying, actually, we don't want to share our resources and we don't want to have financial claims against each other in the same way that married couples can enter into nuptial agreements now. So I think you know, whilst you're absolutely right, and I've said it myself, there's a huge range of options which makes the remedy potentially complicated. The law needs to change and we need to do something in England and Wales. I completely agree, Sue. I think um, it should be incumbent upon us as advisors to ask the question, is there something that can be changed would, which would produce a fairer outcome for our clients, for, our, for families that we advise? Um, I just want to pick up your point about um, people not understanding their rights and, and what they might be entitled to. I worry that actually a lot of married people also don't understand the law that applies to them. And so, you know, your man on the Clapham omnibus um, is thinking about cohabitees relative to what cohabitees should get relative to what spouses might get. And I think there is a thinking amongst the general public that cohabitees just should get less. Um, but I, I, I do think there is a problem with married couples also not knowing what law would apply to them. It really does come back to education and people who are lucky enough to be in the position to be able to take advice can pay for us to help them. It's the people who aren't in that situation that are really left struggling. Absolutely. Um, I am going to pick up a couple of questions. Um, just coming back to uh, a, a, another question from James Peary about um, jurisdiction. So we were talking about jurisdiction and what we what all advisors need to be aware of in terms of um, the uh, the regime in the jurisdiction that they don't usually advise in. Um, James is asking about the analysis of habitual residence, the definition of habitual residence. Um, do you want to maybe give give some clarity on how that is determined in each jurisdiction? Okay, shall I shall I go first on that? So I think in the context that we're talking about here, habitual residence has some relevance to the question of Schedule 1 claims potentially, and Sue can talk about that. I mean, broadly, in terms of habitual residence for children, um, the approach that the Scottish courts takes um, to that test is a test that would be familiar, an approach that would be familiar to solicitors in England and Wales. I think on the, on the question of cohabitation claims uh, in Scotland, the issue of habitual residence is a funny one because, again, coming back to the idea that jurisdiction is based on where there would be jurisdiction here, divorce proceedings, in terms of our Scottish uh, divorce jurisdiction, jurisdiction can exist where somebody's been habitually resident in Scotland for 12 months. That's a, that's a basis of jurisdiction. 
So you might envisage a situation where somebody in England and Wales on breakdown is advised, as you might do in a divorce, um, get yourself back to Scotland, um, wait out the 12 months and then raise an action. But of course, the problem we have with cohabitation is that there's a 12 month time limit for breakdown of cohabitation uh, to make a claim. So almost by the time you've got a jurisdictional basis, 12 months, you might then have run out of your 12 month time limit for actually making your application. So you would have to be very lucky or very crafty uh, to bring about a situation where you could um, bring yourself within the ambit of the Scottish courts on a habitual residence basis um, without triggering the breakdown of your cohabitation at the same time. Thank you. So, so I mean, habitual residence in terms of um, Schedule 1 is literally where the, the children are based, where they're going to school, where they're, they're settled for the time being. So that's what you're looking at, the reality of the situation in terms of whether you're, you're pursuing a claim in relation to that rather than based on domicile. Okay. And if I can just pick up a question that was asked um, by Howard. So uh, when we were looking at the fact pass pattern of Jesse and Angus at the start, um, we, we were thinking about their claims. Howard asks, would someone like Jesse have any more rights if she was a vulnerable person? So if, for example, she had mild learning difficulties, a history of depression, mental health issues in England specifically. Sue, could you pick that up? So again, coming back to the ability for Jesse to make claims, you're looking at whether there is a constructive trust or a proprietary estoppel claim. Um, and it, it really is about understanding objectively what was said and what someone in Jesse's situation would have understood. So my immediate answer to the question is no, it wouldn't make any difference at all. But then I would caveat that by saying, actually, you've got to look at objectively at the subjective situation. So again, really understanding exactly how Angus has, has dealt with things and, and Jesse's level of understanding. So I'm not sure that that answers the question fully, but I think um, she's still going to be very vulnerable. The fact that she has extra needs doesn't in itself give her a claim. Right, okay. So it might, it would be a factor that the court would consider, but it wouldn't. Coming no. back to Angus's intention under a trust claim and Angus's promises and the assurances that he's given and the, the, the actual context and their course of dealing. Thank you. Um, just to uh, talk about how we speak to clients about these issues, uh, despite the extra provisions in Scotland, um, I assume couples moving in together are well advised to take the same precautions as they would um, to protect their position as their peers in England and Wales. So I'm thinking about formalising agreements, cohabitation agreements, making a will. Is that the advice you would be giving in Scotland, Robert? I think broadly, yes. Um, if you were uh, advising somebody who was uh, considering uh, cohabitation, um, you would outline where they might find themselves and the provisions that would apply and break down and explain the pros and cons of entering into uh, some kind of cohabitation agreement. And often there will be significant benefit to doing that. Um, the one caveat around that is that and again, this is something that has been criticised in our current legislation. There's nothing in the statutory provisions that tell the court how to approach a situation where a written agreement between the parties exists, what weight to give that, how to take that into account in considering any claim. And the orthodox view here is that it would be a contract like any other, and it would not be likely that the court would override the contractual provision that the parties had made by imposing a, a, a remedy in terms of the statutory provision, but we've got no case law on that. Um, and it remains to be seen uh, what a court might do where a cohabitation agreement um, cuts across and completely undermines an award that a court might otherwise have thought it appropriate to make. Um, so, I mean, that is one of the really interesting points that we still don't have any good guidance from the courts on. In divorce, we have specific statutory provisions, for example, that allow a court to set aside an agreement if it wasn't fair and reasonable. Nothing in the cohabitation legislation of a similar nature. 
Um, so the conventional view would be yes, if you want to contract out, you can, but that's yet to be properly tested. Thank you. And as the law stands in England, again, we would always recommend cohabitation agreements for anyone entering into a relationship. But as it stands at the moment, cohabitation agreements are really intended to record the party's intentions. So again, it's, it's to a certain extent about educating and about getting people to think about actually what they want to happen in practice, to then record their agreement, to then avoid the dispute further down the line. So in the same way that uh, Robert's just talked about in Scotland, we've got very limited case law on cohabitation agreements um, and their enforceability, but they are viewed as a contract. There is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be upheld if they are entered into properly. And the reality is that if people enter into a cohabitation agreement, they're not, or they're less likely to dispute it further down the line. They've gone through the process, they've talked about it, they've agreed to it, and they're going to uphold it in practice. So um, it's absolutely the best form of insurance and the best form of avoiding the dispute and the conflict under the expense of what happens if people separate without a clear understanding of who owns what or what they want to happen in that eventuality. I am uh, conscious of time, so that might be a good point to draw things to a close. Um, if you have any further questions arising out of the discussion we've had this morning, please, please do get in touch. Our contact details are on the screen now. Thank you so much for attending and for your contributions. It was really appreciated. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Sue.